There's no way he brings in a 1994 Australis. Wow. Meant to be. Clear night sky in, in Lord Springs is just mind blowing. You can just see every star in the world and just the full Milky Way. And um, here we are. So, mum and dad literally picked up the dictionary, got Found the a le- word letter for it. A. Yeah. Astronomy. Found Astralis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Means pertaining to the stars or celestial being or heavenly body. And so, to recreate this was like, you know, a 360 degree label. It was actually Australia's first ever $100 bottle of wine. So Dad was aggressive when he was younger and uh, just, you know, believed in it. And I think at the time, Grange and Villa Grace was sort of circling 86 bucks. The 1994, if you had to put a price on it for a sale? Uh, I'd be putting a a few thousand dollars, I think. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Got Some, a wine podcast hosted by Master Sommelier Carlos Santos and, you know, WSE2 Level 2, uh, High Merit, Pass Water, you know, whatever. I'm Angus O'Loughlin. I love you to be here. Um, this episode is going to be something incredibly special. We are opening up iconic Australian wines, not but like international, world-class wines. Um, Alex, I'm going to say, um, should I attempt it? Go for it. No, I can't. How do I say your last name? <laughs> Bratasiuk. Bratasiuk. I wish I did commit Nailed to it. it. Um, what's the history of Bratasiuk? We Ukrainian. Yeah. So yeah. your dad was a first immigrant to here in Australia? His brother was born on the boat on the way out here. Wow. Um, I've still got my grandma's or babushka's Nazi passport. They yeah, had a horrible experience in Ukraine and then tried to leave Europe and uh, caught by Nazis. And yeah, long story short, they just got on the first boat that was leaving Europe. Yeah. <laughs> and it was coming to Australia. So um, dad's wow. brother was born on the way out here. Can only imagine what that would have been like as a parent. Wild. <laughs> and uh, dad was born shortly after arriving here. Um, but yeah, his story is quite unique. He grew up, um, you know, with ne- next to nothing, and um, and grew, grew up with chickens and vegetables and things like that that they ate from in the backyard. Yeah, um, as you do. <laughs> Good European migrant family. That's right, yeah. Um, but yeah, discovered wine relatively late in life. He was um, a sort of self-propelled guy. Um, biochemistry was his interest, and it wasn't until his brother got married uh, that he actually discovered wine. It was never part of sort of his family life when he was younger. And when he discovered it, it just absolutely blew his hair back. Mm. And it just spawned a whole lifetime of searching and discovery. And he sort of discovered arguably the what we, we'd consider the icons of uh, the fine wine world 30 or 40 years before the internet yeah. came out. Um, so he was, you know, he discovered some of these domains and chateaus and just it just absolutely brought him to life and he bought as much as he could and went home and drank these wines and wrote journals and journals and compared them to other Australian wines and all this time he was just you know just planning the next trip back and the next trip back and he did this for forever and um yeah his collection is amazing and he's been very generous and uh opened up a lot of amazing wines to me over my life uh, sort of grown up with drinking, you know, fully mature Burgundies and Bordeaux, you know, 30, circa 30 years old. Wow. That you can't drink anymore today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> just to see those does. wines at full apogee, you know, to see that full terroir um, expression with, you know, all the minerals and all of the tertiary, you know, elements there. Um, that was my schooling. We're going to get a little bit of a journey about the story of, um, you know, Roman, your dad, and yeah. also, you know, you're now, um, you know, he's retired, you've taken over the, the winery, but we're going to have a little bit of dad and son influences in front of us because can you tell us what you've brought in and, and also what we're going to be trying today? Because there's two bottles here that are just screaming Yeah, we've got two real icon wines here. So these are some of the first wines that we made. Um, So we've got the first ever, uh, actually is the first ever Australian single vineyard uh, Grenache from Blort Springs. Yep. Uh, And that's the 1991 Blort Springs Grenache. And uh, the other old wine that we've got is the first ever Australis, the 1994 Australis. Oh, that's yeah. incredibly special. Thank Carlos you very much. said, as um, Carlos came into the studio, he hadn't read the email that you'd sent. You'd asked for a particular cork, referencing you had an aged bottle. And Carlos, first thing he said was, there's no way he brings in a 1994 <laughs> Australis. Uh, and then you, you picked it. <laughs> you bought it out of the suitcase and it was, wow. It meant yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah, so really amazing story. You know, when Dad started Clarendon Hills, um, you know, he, as I mentioned, was, you know, in love with these wines. Well, really, love is an understatement. He was completely immersed and obsessed with these wines. And uh, every sort of tasting he'd do, it's just the preeminent sort of common denominator 
was that these wines were single vineyard and mm. there just was no single vineyard wines in Australia um, up until Clarendon Hills began. And dad's philosophy oh, the first. was That's to cool. introduce this concept to Australian wine. Mm. And, you know, the market was pretty heavily dominated by like interregional and even interstate blends, um, bigger business looking to sort of make a almost homogenous wine. And dad just despised that. He just knew he could, as a biochemist, make something better. Um, and he knew McLaren Vale was full of these old vines. And more importantly, they were all pre phylloxera old vines. Uh, and underneath that was this amazing myriad and mosaic of terroir and some of the world's oldest geology and that sort of unique uh, combination of old vines and old soils. He just knew in his heart that he could express that and make something world class. So when he began Clarendon Hills, you know, there was just literally what we'd find on the table here to start a winery with mm. um, and just his passion. So he, the first vineyard that we ever picked actually was the Clarendon Hills, what we now know as Australis Vineyard, but it was just humbly titled Clarendon Hills Shiraz back in those days. So throughout the years 90, 91, 92, 93, that's all it was titled. It was Clarendon Hills Shiraz. Uh, but the same sort of methodology applied. He'd, you know, pick the vineyard himself. He'd, you know, ferry all these buckets of grapes up to a shed um, in his little Honda Civic. And, you know, then he'd stay up all day and night with a bloody empty Rousseau bottle and a bucket. And that was the crusher. <laughs> wow. And just an empty wine bottle. Empty wine bottle. It's mate. like a thick one, like from Burgundy or something, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just smashing grapes away. Um, and he'd keep the stilks and things. Um, and the wines were made, you know, in utter respect um, to wines of Burgundy. And that was his sort of, you know, reference point and passion, really deep mm. passion for and so, you know, a lot of those wines were all, yeah, 100% stalk fermented um, and also, you know, matured in sort of third hand barrels. We had no money back then. And, you know, then hand bottled by dad. And, uh, you know, that was the, the snowball that he wow. grew. And he had to sell like every single bottle to pay for more barrels and more grapes. And he just grew like this snowball year after year after year. Uh, and he was a one man band for like the first, I think, eight and a bit years. Wow. And, yes. I remember not seeing dad, um, you know, for a lot of the time when I was younger. Uh, but when I did, he'd have these purple hands and that was like a huge, you know, if you'd stick out like when you were a kid, like dad's got purple hands. <laughs> you <laughs> drop off to school and people yeah. are like, there's something wrong with your dad. He's got some terrible circulation. <laughs> no, he's just been harvesting. Yeah. Um, so where would you like us to start? Do you want to start with the Grenache story with the first yeah, ever? I'd love and to. Then, yeah, I'd love great. to. Because we have, you know, 30 year apart examples. We've got, you know, 1991, Australia's first ever single vineyard Grenache. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the most recent release of the 2021 Romas, which is the same vineyard, mm -hmm. um, albeit we've sort of like over the years detected superior parcels of the vineyard. And this is the ultimate parcel from that site. So all old vines, I mean, all yeah. bush vines. All, all very old dry grown like, pre phylloxera yeah. bush vines. Uh, and they just look like these old hands that grow out of the earth. And mm -hmm. that's what I've actually put on the label. The label, yeah. The new uh, newest release and you know dad just loved these old vines mm. and no one was making Grenache obviously back then um, and you know he was making it with stalks in the ferment um, you know they're all sort of circa 13% alcohol and the market just loved it like the mm. fruit the clarity mm. on the berries just raspberries blueberries strawberries that sort of you know caper and you know with the, all the lifted uh, florals and some dried herb Everywhere dad would go, he would see everyone's eyes light up. And, mm. you know, this spawned a whole, you know, lifetime. The last 35 years, he's traveled the world just telling everybody he could who would listen uh, <laughs> about you know, Blewett Springs and how great it is and how rarefied the terroir is. You know, Blewett Springs is sort of like a, an old beach in the middle of the mountains. It's such a unique spot. Um, you know, we're about seven kilometers inland. But 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, when polar caps melted, that's where the sea levels rose. So we have the deposited shoreline oh. in the middle of the mountains as a result of that. So it's like vine, soil and climate obviously are all very, very important for wine. But it seems, like, it seems like for you, soil seems to be probably the most... The, that was dad's interest. Yeah. He wanted to highlight the terroir, the personality, the just the individual organic signature that you get. Mm -hmm from nowhere else in the world, but this one particular place makes that expression in the wine. And that's just what 
brought dad to life. Amazing. Let's talk about the, the the difference here. So we've got and put them, you know, into onto the palette, um, sure. which I already have, to be honest. Um, we've got the 1991, the first single vineyard Grenache, mm -hmm. and then we've obviously got the 2021 release. Um, really interesting, you know. Obviously the same vines, but it's great to see what you know a bit of age and a bit of you know secondary um, flavors and aromas are coming through. I mean, I'm getting like this beautiful tobacco on this. Yeah, on, on you, the get, you get all the Grenache. tertiary characters yeah. once it's mm. fully mature. You know, you get that forest floor, truffly, mm. porcini mushroom sort of background. Yeah. And as you say, it's tobacco -y, a little leathery. You get mm. a lot of dry spice as well. Still fruit though. Exactly. The, That's fruit, what I was just the, about fruit, to say. the fruit is beautiful. It's yeah. like yeah. ripe, yeah. Never, juicy, never, strawberry. Never wanes. Isn't that That's, what, that's what the wild thing is. A that's what I love about Grenache and is Grenache produces these in an organic chemistry sense, it produces these unfermentable sugar compounds that, for instance, give cherries, raspberries, and strawberries, and also blueberries, their identifying flavors. And what I love about the sort of modern um, evolution, you know, that we can see towards the younger example mm. is just all of the sort of best elements have been addressed. And we're now teasing out more of this like floral rose petal aroma. And we're starting to see more mineral influence as well. You know, mm -hmm. obviously the vines are another 30 years mm -hmm. of age. Crazy. Grenache has second to Pinot Noir, um, the second highest surface root area, a surface area of its root network. So it's highly um, reflective of its mineral environment. So talking about, you know, this is your dad. Uh, yeah. You know, this is Roman. Like you said, this is him by himself at this point, right? Yeah, exactly. Making the wine. Yep. Yeah. And then this is, you know, under the, you know, the, I guess, new management of yourself and, and, and a team. Oh, this is far superior. You know, we've got, you know, a number of winemakers now involved in the business, you know, yep. viticulturalists. We've got another 30 years experience with the one vineyard. Um, we've got 30 years refinement on dad's own, you know, expertise as well. And you can just see like it's at a, such a heightened state of refinement, the new example. And, you know, as a marketer, it's hard to sort of t say to dad, you know, you need to make better wine. Nah. <laughs> it's impossible. Um, I was going to say, does Roman still come into and just like, oh, you know, yeah, be so doing, he's, he's, like he's that retired before. He's, he's now at a, a stage in the business that he's just, he'd never, ever, ever leave it. It's a, it's a part of his DNA. Yeah. He's just flat out on the phones, you know, ordering, you know, viticultural, make sure they're spraying, make sure you're doing this, doing that. And, you know, he's always driving through the vineyards, he's always out there. Um, you know, I join him prior to vintage for about you know six weeks before we harvest just doing samples he's checking the leaves making sure everything's all healthy um you know other times of the year he's just in the barrel hall just tasting with mm. a barrel spear and a glass and that's what i'm now you know trying to be up there every day that he's doing that and you just learn so much you know dad's yeah. had these amazing tastings you know before clarity hills even began you know tasting with charles russo and eric russo from the famed you know domain de russo um, in Burgundy, it, you know, that's just one example. He has had, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of these experiences getting invited to their house for dinner afterwards and opening, you know, really just amazing old things. Um, and this, you know, ext extended also into Bordeaux and Champagne. And he has just like lived an amazing life mm. um, and, and given me a, an amazingly privileged um you know, education off the back of it. Actually, my middle name is Bailey, uh, named in testament to Bailey Caritas. Oh, Dr. Bailey Caritas. Yeah, Dr. Bailey. And um, I'm named after him because dad, he was a mentor to dad or dad was, Bailey was a mentor to dad. And uh, dad uh, used to just drive over there and help him during vintage and sleep on what's now the cellar door floor over there. Oh, cool. And um, Bailey was a, you know, eccentric guy, but taught dad a lot. And dad had a huge amount of respect for him and named me, I'm his eldest son, after Bailey, so I feel oh, quite wow. um, privileged to, to wow. receive that blessing. What a connection Pretty as well yeah. to our yeah. last episode. There you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you what go. timing. Right yeah. <laughs> Shall we try? Yeah. So the Australis is, um, his, is it Syrah or Shiraz? How do we? Yeah, that... it's, it's, it's Syrah. It's made in testament to the, the French style. Um, and the correct Latin term for the variety is Vitus vinifera Syrah. And Shiraz is actually a, a term that only Australians use. For many, for the first sort of 25 years of Clarendon Hills history, we were 100% dedicated to export markets that you'd have to explain what Shiraz is. Mm -hmm. So we obviously went down the Syrah side of things. Jeez. But the, the story of Australis, you know, really began in the first vintage of Clarendon Hills in 1990. So... That was actually the first vineyard that we ever picked, uh, well, I should say that dad ever picked. Uh, and that was literally him out there from, you know, six o'clock in the morning, picking grapes, ferrying them in a little Honda, 
um, breaking up these bunches um, with an empty burgundy bottle um, and whole stalk, stalk fermenting them. And he made this wine for the first couple of years and just humbly titled it, you know, Clarendon Hills Shiraz back in those days. Yeah. And uh, just every year, every barrel tasting, every time he showed anybody anybody these wines, he just like reinforced his solemn belief that this wine was out of this world. And he got to the 94 vintage, but it was, he just convinced himself that he was going to call it something different this year. Didn't know what it was. And we actually got contacted um, by a famous photographer who had just left um, Domaine de la Romney Conti and through an interpreter said, you know, I want to photograph you. And so he came out and photographed dad and couldn't speak a common language, but dad being dad got him absolutely blind drunk, <laughs> <laughs> barrel tasting all day and night. And this guy took a photo that dad didn't see for months afterwards, but this is back in the film days, obviously with cameras. Yeah, of uh, this guy developed the camera photos and blew, it, blew up the shot. And a clear night sky in, in Blue Springs is just mind blowing. You can just see every star in the world and just the full, Milky Way, and um, this guy ended up, you know, getting his handwritten letter, sending it to Dad, saying, "This is my favorite photo I've ever taken." This guy's photograph, you know, Oberville Lane, plunging tanks oh, and things like this. Bumps. <laughs> and Dad just had this like goosebumps, mm, Dad, yeah, his whole body lit up, and it's like, "That's it. That's exactly what it's all about," you know. And here we are. So Mum and Dad literally picked up the dictionary, <laughs> got Found the a le word letter for it. A, yeah. <laughs> Astronomy? Found ah, Astralis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it means pertaining to the stars or celestial being or heavenly body. Ah, and nice. so to recreate this was like, you know, a 360 degree label. Yeah. Which is such, back in 1994, the artistry, the, the level, like from the aesthetic of it, that's so clever. Like when you did just do a little 12, people are watching this on YouTube, you saw that. But for people who listen to the podcast, um, you know, it caught the light in the camera and like, it's like a little dazzling of a star by using that little bit of gold on the yep. label. It's super special. So that's, that's the whole connection with that photograph and just this undying belief that this wine was so spectacular and he just needed to share it with the world. Yeah. And so, yeah, we released it. Um, it was actually Australia's first ever $100 bottle of wine. Mm. So dad was aggressive when he was younger and, uh, just, Believed, you know, in believed in it. Believed in it. Yeah. And I think at the time, Grange and Hiller Grace was sort of circa 86 bucks. So there were a lo <laughs> lot of pundits that sort of said, who the F is this guy? Mm. <laughs> um, but, you know, dad said, all right, well, you know, you tell me. And he had this big tasting, sort of similar to what I did yesterday here with the trade day. Put a big tasting on, had everybody who's anybody in the country come and taste these wines and had all these brown paper bags lined up and just said, all right, you tell me your top three wines and give me three points for one. Two points for two and Factor. one point for three. And long story short, Astralis came out with more points than all the other ones put together and could have gone easily a backfire on him. But that was dad's just belief. And he's just never wavered in that and um, been very, yeah, he's, he's given me that sort of passion as well. Unbelievable. <clears throat> um, it's delicious. So uh, basically, you know, Alex said we'd love to put in an order for six bottles at $100. <laughs> so we'll grab six more of the 1994 Six hundred bucks. Send me an invoice. No dramas. We'll get that done for you. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's delicious. Yeah, the the, uh, the nose on it is just stratospheric. Yeah. It's, it's like you know oh. truffle and forest floor and 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 dried roses. It looks like an amazing old Hermitage, um, and it's it's what thirty years old now. Twenty yeah. twenty nine years old. Twenty nine. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Absolutely. Still so full of life. Mm. Oh. So do you even sell you would nineteen ninety four at this point it's just oh, museum honestly, we wines, could have sold it? this like a hundred times over. Yeah, this is own just we just always reserve a small proportion of what we make for yeah. internal purposes like this. Yeah. Um Dad has actually alerted me to that we've got some Jeroboams of this oh, yeah. somewhere. Oh god. Which would be scary good. Is that you, six liters? Three liters. Three liters. Three yep. liters. Magnums, yep. one point five. Sorry, yep. three. So yep. you just don't know where they are. So uh, well, no yeah, one knows. Interestingly, so, uh... you told me about that they exist, but didn't tell me where they are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> Not the money is. It, it, you know, it, I do want to speak about why. You know, the bottle is. Um, I think the twenty twenty we're going to have is five hundred bucks. That's like correct. You can buy That's them the on current your... RRP. Yeah. Yeah. The nineteen ninety four. If you had to put a price on it for a sale, like let's say, I mean, you probably don't have the stock that you could put it on the website. What do you think it would be worth? I. Uh, be putting a, a few thousand dollars, I think. Yeah. Probably circa oh, two yeah. and a half. Jeez, oh, mate. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. that's a pleasure. And that, that's what the money does. The taste, it feels well, it's, that way. It's, it's the history of it. I was going to say, the, the story, story for me is the like, worth money. The, is. That's the, the ultimate value for us. It's probably more, probably more valuable from, from our point of view than, than it would be from, from anyone, anyone else. But it's, uh, it's a very special old wine. Yeah. And it's really weird. Clarendon Hills, 
you know, jumped out of the stratosphere of Australian wine and, and, you know, we got discovered by Robert Parker and all the international critics. And this is what opened up all the doors around the world for Clarendon Hills and dad. Um, 1,000 wines in the world. It was in the names in the top 1,000. Yes, that's um, right. Of the, all time. Since sorry, just, 1727 to 2010, I believe. Yeah. So mm-hmm. and that was conducted by 11 European uh, MWs. Yeah. Yeah. So what did that mean for you at the time? Or did, you know, was that awarded in 2010 or whenever that was? So, And what yeah. did that mean to your dad? Oh, uh, that was around an era. We got our first 100 points as well. Mm. Um, had a couple of times 100 yeah, points Yeah, we've had well. it, received it a few times, but the first time's always very special, uh, especially after receiving, you know, 11 or so, 99 out of 100s prior to that. Yeah. So it was, you never forget the first time. And, um, you know, that, at that time also we we'll, We'd received also a few other rewards, so it was it was a very very special time, and it's a time that I remember I was still making wine with Dad as well. Uh, so, you know, that first hundred point score that we got from Lisa Pirotti Brown from Wine Advocate, uh, I couldn't sleep the night before. I was just all I was thinking about was tasting. I just thought, stuff it, I'm going to go up there and open the wines. Okay. Got up there, at, you know, three o'clock in the morning, and yeah. just started double decanting and just tasting everything and. You know, and then Lisa arrived with her film crew and was doing some tasting and the, the stories, the eyes never lie, you know, and you could just see her eyes go, whoa. It was like, yeah. I knew that one was special. And, you know, doing all the extra pumping over and all the extra tasting in the barrel hall, just making sure it was as good as we could make it. And, you know, then when we got the score, it was like, you know, felt I was a part of that production process and, and also my brother as well, working alongside my dad. So it was, you never forget those moments. Amazing. Awesome. So Australia is being uh, four, hec- four hectare still? Or? Yeah, it's a very, very small vineyard. How much How much do you make out of it, it varies. So it's hectares? obviously all dry grown, but, you know, dry years like 2020, we're getting, you know, not very much, like, you know, 450 six packs. Wow. Yeah. And that's oh, for wow. the world. And then larger, wetter years like, you know, 2011, for example, mm-hmm. we're getting, you know, 1,500 six packs. So it can vary a huge mm-hmm. amount. Yeah. That makes sense. And you were saying, I'm um, not sure if you want to talk about it, but if your dad has a pretty good personal private seller. He does. He's been buying wine for, you know, as long as I've been alive. Yeah. So he's, um, you know, we worked out at one stage, he was buying more Rousseau Chambertin uh, than New York was getting allocated. <laughs> In Australia. He was coming <laughs> he was more buying to... five dozen no every year and buying five dozen of everything, granted. But, um, oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, we've had um, the... the Pleasure of, of hosting Cereal Rousseau at our winery, and she was you know signing magnums of Clos Saint Jacques and 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 Chambertin and wow. Clos and uh, things. Special. Dad's had you know family dinners um, when Eric um, Rousseau was still alive. Um, you know we've had a lot of amazing experiences, um, and also a lot of um, generous experiences by our national distributor, which is Domain Wine Shippers, and that's run by the Steele family, mm-hmm. and predominantly Gary Steele. Um, when he was more involved in the business sort of 20, 30 years ago. And you know, it was my experience with, um, with Gary, with, you know, I'd come home from school and he was on the couch drinking Russo with dad and teaching dad all about these amazing wines. Uh-huh. And, you know, dad has gone to stay with, with Gary in, in Burgundy and um, Gary owns a house with Halliday, James Halliday over there and, you know, staying in those, in that house in Monty and, and going to visit all these domains and Monty, lovely. Yeah. You know, they, they bring in some of the most amazing wines, you know, Russo, Rabineau's, Vogue, um, you know, Mongiard, Mounieret, you know, just the, the list goes on. Just yeah, of icon, course. icon makers. Of course. Once you're there, once you're there, you're there, right? Yeah, once well, you, exactly. You, when you know, in Rome, you, you, why, you, why yeah. wouldn't you just taste yeah. everything? So there's, there's, this is like a very, uh, my personal question is like, <clears throat> I have some nice, my nice, uh, you know, uh, bottles in my cellar, but I can't find the occasion for them. When your dad has the nicest wines of all time that could be open. He could probably open one every day for the rest of his foreseeable life into the great futures of past a hundred and still not probably touch the sides of this seller collection. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, dad sort of tapered off buying for those reasons that it's just, he won't you can never get catch to up. experience <laughs> yeah. those wines at full apogee. And that's what he likes is he wants to buy the wines and not, and forget about them basically. Yeah. And then drink them when they're that their full potential. Yeah. So, you know, touching a Richborg or a Chambertin for, for the first 30 years is just absolutely never going to happen. Yeah. But then, you know, when you've got this collection, it's like, all right, I'm going to do all 96s today and just open up, you know, five or six oh, of these God. things. Oh. Yeah. 
How cool is that? That's, uh, that's been, yeah. you know, that's on a Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. Oh, Tuesday afternoon. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm going, yeah. Christmas? No. no, no Tuesdays. So that's honestly been every day of my life. Of wow. Just the exposure to these wines, multiple, multiple bottles, taste them over every vintage, good years and bad. Mm. Um, you know, buying wines, you know, you pay a lot for the good years and you can get some bargains in cheap years. Yeah. And then yeah. eventually, you know, they, you become, can, they yeah, can become they exceptional. Change, yeah. 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 So sometimes... Um, you get surprised, you know, the critics write off a vintage and he's like, it actually sounds not too bad. And he just buys it because it's cheap. And, yeah. and then boom, 30 years later, it looks amazing. So yeah, for sure. that's all the, the great, you know, great unknowns of, of wine. Yeah. I think my favorite wine was the 91. Yeah, it's, it's very, very it's like special. Now, right now, if you come back to the glass, even without the 91, swirling, don't swirl because you're going to evaporate, but it's like yeah. so beautiful, delicate. Yeah, I love the strawberry in that. It's just so I mean, clear. I like the I love the ninety four, of course. I mean, yeah. but I feel like the ninety four still has another five, six, ten years. Is like it's still still powerful, it's still smoky, sure. and yeah, yeah. The smoke is the ninety one. The ninety one is uh, is I think so silky. Well, it's just amazing to see you know thirty year old Grenache. You know, we drink <laughs> Grenache like almost the the day it's bottled in this yeah. country now. And arguably, you know, it's a good thing. You know, I love the the clarity on young Grenache, mm. but when you see an old example, um, it's pretty special. Thank you so much for letting us be part of this. Uh, you know, I feel like it's it's opening wine, but it also feels like it's sort of like, what, what was that guy's name who came up? It wasn't Michael Usher, but the guy who came out and did This Is Your Life. It oh, right. feels like, you know... We've, you've surprised us with the you know a, a partaking in finding out a bit about you know Roman story, traveling over here by boat. That amazing story of you know your brother, his brother being born on that ship, um, and starting out as an immigrant into turning into you know one of Australia's best, most iconic and sought it, after. It ones. really is like you know the summary of a great Australian dream. You know to it start is. from absolutely nothing um, and just believe in yourself yeah. and back yourself. And you know I still remember those arguments from my parents. You know and mum saying you're not a wine maker, mm. and dad's like. Bullshit. Yeah, watch me. <laughs> this was an amazing experience, Alex. Um, so would to you. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to come in and and uh, hopefully, you know, our listeners are learning a bit more about Clarendon Hills like we got the opportunity today. Researching, you know, who you are and a bit of the story of the Clarendon Hills story is something, but, you know, learning so much more past what we could find online today is, uh, oh, is awesome. My pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you about my family story. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. And thank you yeah. so much. I feel uh, a little privileged. Thank you so much. Yeah.